Prague, Kingdom of Bohemia, 1621. The axe falls, then falls again. Nobles die, knights are slain, some have their hands chopped off, others are quartered and put on spikes. 27 leaders of the Bohemian Revolt, the Protestant uprising against the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II, die one after the other. Ferdinand, it is said, plans to dominate and recatholicize Bohemia. He's ordered all Protestants to convert or leave. Back on the street, a common woman watches the executions unfold, axes and swords falling again and again. Then she goes home, and trying to make sense of what she's seen, opens her Bible to the book of Revelation. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. She closes her book. This war, she knew, had only just begun. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for bringing this episode to the table. The Thirty Years' War was one of the most destructive periods in all of European history. Three decades of bloodletting, massacre, and death that would not be surpassed in body count until the trenches of World War I. And that's an incredible concept, considering that the armies that went to war between 1618 and 1648 had none of the mechanized instruments of slaughter available in the 20th century. This was a war of pike and shot, where men went to battle hefting bladed weapons or muskets so heavy that they required a forked stand to rest them on. Yet even with just these crude implements, up to 8 million people lost their lives. The death toll, however, did not fall equally in all places. Kicked off by a political religious dispute in the Holy Roman Empire, the vast majority of the fighting took part in Central Europe, so the population there bore the heaviest share of the violence. In some areas, over half the population died, and the empire lost about 20% of its people. Civilian casualties outnumbered military deaths 7 to 1, and the Holy Roman Empire would take a century to recover its population. But describing in detail why this happened is difficult. In fact, we could spend an entire series just explaining why this war started, the early military campaigns, or how the Treaty of Westphalia ended it. Instead, we've decided to take a look at the Thirty Years' War as a massive humanitarian crisis and explore why the body count reached such incredible heights. We'll look at factors like military violence and battles, but also starvation, poor harvests, weather conditions, and outbreaks of epidemic disease. And as a frame for all of this, we'll be using a device that many people in the worst affected lands turned to, apocalyptism. The four horsemen from the King James Bible, unleashed to scour a quarter of the earth, are an ideal way to divide the period's many dangers. Conquest, war, famine, and death. And today, we'll be looking at the first. Conquest. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to a church door in 1517, he not only sparked a religious reformation, he plunged Europe into what would become decades of religious war. Political units across the continent, from kingdoms like England and Bohemia down to levels of individual towns, broke out into struggles over both church doctrine and political power. And nowhere is this more true than the lands of the Holy Roman Empire, which quickly became a patchwork of majority Catholic and majority Lutheran provinces, towns, and cities. But war is a destructive and expensive endeavor, and by 1555, pretty much everyone was sick of it. So that year, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, part of the Habsburg family that had a lock on the position of emperor, signed a treaty with the League of Lutheran Princes in Augsburg, Germany. The Peace of Augsburg had a single idea at its heart, expressed by the phrase, whose realm, his religion, meaning, essentially, the prince of a realm, whatever its size, could decide whether to be Catholic or Lutheran and enforce that religious conformity on his territory. Those that did not wish to convert would then move to an area whose prince practiced their chosen faith. And for a while, the Peace of Augsburg worked pretty well. The key words, of course, being for a while. See, the Holy Roman Empire was a patchwork anyway, comprised of not big provinces, but estates. Some only a few square miles, and not even continuous, where the head authority was a prince. Though in reality, these princes could be lords, counts, bishops, knights, abbots, or even a representative of a free city. Each of these had a vote at the imperial diet and was semi-autonomous. Then the emperors were elected by seven elector princes, and as a result, had very little direct control over lands in the empire unless their family personally governed them. 
So, whose realm, his religion, was a fitting solution for this decentralized empire. And on a day-to-day -day basis, German Lutherans and Catholics became pretty used to each other. In fact, evidence indicates up to 20% of marriages crossed that theological division. Things were stable. Not without tension or danger, but people were able to navigate the chasm in their daily lives. But the Peace of Augsburg did leave out a Protestant group that even the Lutherans considered heretics. Calvinists who, among other theological differences with Lutherans, argued that Jesus was only spiritually present in the bread and wine served during communion. Because Calvinists were not included in the Peace of Augsburg, they had no religious protections, even when under a Lutheran ruler, meaning their safety hinged on whoever was in charge and how lenient they were, which is how things kicked off in Bohemia in 1618. For nearly a decade, the Holy Roman Emperors had expanded Protestant rights in Bohemia. This included a pragmatic decree called the Letter of Majesty, granting religious freedom to the Bohemian estates and letting Bohemians develop what amounted to a state church. But in 1617, Holy Roman Emperor Matthias was sickly and childless, wanting to solve his succession issue before he passed on. So he got the Bohemian estates, which voted on their kings, to elect his cousin Ferdinand II as the next king of Bohemia after he died. Which was a problem, since it was well known that Ferdinand was a hardline Catholic who wanted to eradicate Protestantism within the empire. And once Ferdinand had gotten enough Lutheran princes on his side to win, the Calvinists were terrified. After all, Emperor Matthias was sick, and when he died, Ferdinand would not only become the King of Bohemia, he would also almost certainly be elected as Holy Roman Emperor. He'd lead the whole empire and also govern Bohemia directly. And that's when it all went out the window. Literally. Because when Ferdinand sent a pair of hardline Catholic governors to administer Bohemia in his absence, a group of Bohemian Protestants met them at Prague Castle. After the pair read aloud a threatening letter from Ferdinand, the assembled Protestant nobles responded by throwing the pair out the window. Now, what happened next depends on who you believe. Catholic propagandists say that angels swept down to catch the governors, while Protestants said the men survived because they fell in a giant pile of dung. And then we have historians pointing out that they landed on a gradual slope and broke a lot of bones. With this second defenestration of Prague, that being a fancy word for throwing someone out a window, and yeah, this was the second time it happened, the Thirty Years' War began. The revolt spread across Bohemia, which was already primed for religious war. And it might have stayed a local conflict, except that Matthias died, and Frederick did succeed him as Holy Roman Emperor, causing panic amongst other Protestants in the empire. Then sides formed. Austrian Protestants joined the Rising, as did some in Germany. Bohemia attempted to join the Protestant Union, a group of Protestant estates in the empire that formed as a sort of mutual defense pact, and invited the Calvinist elector prince, Frederick V, to be king of Bohemia. Ferdinand, by turn, called in military aid from his cousin Philip II, the king of Spain, forming the Catholic League. This Catholic League marched on Austria, one of their armies headed by the Count of Tilly, a brilliant but ruthless commander. Then, on November 8, 1620, 27,000 Catholic troops stood outside Prague, the only thing in their way being 15,000 Bohemians on a low rise called White Mountain. The Bohemians crumpled, a flank attack sending their first units into retreat. Many rebels, seeing their fellows running, joined the rout without firing a shot. Then the Imperial cavalry surrounded and massacred them, 4,000 dead in an hour. Ferdinand had entered Prague as a conqueror, and the Habsburgs would personally govern Bohemia for the next 300 years. A few months later, the axes raised and fell on the rebel leaders. Frederick V went into exile, and the man who welcomed him to Prague had his tongue nailed to the city gate. But Ferdinand had pushed too far, and this would not stay a small regional conflict, for the second horseman was on his way to take peace from the earth. War. Oh boy, Zoe, there is no way we are tackling another Horseman of the Apocalypse on an empty stomach. Ooh, you know what we need? Ha <laughs> ha, you read my mind, furry friendo. It's dinner time, and there's no better way to get a home-cooked meal fast than from HelloFresh. I love that they wanted to sponsor this episode, because I've been using them to keep my belly happy and save me time since before I even joined the EC crew. Seriously, they're one of the only reasons I'm able to eat as well as I do while still balancing so many episodes in production. And there's a lot. No grocery stores, no stressful meal planning, just everything I need to prepare wholesome tasty meals delivered right to my door. Then I'm eating in a half hour or less. Speaking of eating, this week I made balsamic tomato and herb chicken, with Zoe's help of course, and it was awesome. Then Jeff told me he whipped up some pub style shepherd's pie for his family, which looked so good I already put it on my list for next time. Wait a minute, Zoe, what are you doing? 
Come on, cat, you already had dinner. And deliciousness aside, another thing I really love about HelloFresh is their commitment to sustainability. Ingredients are pre-portioned, so we waste less food. And I was excited to learn that the carbon footprint of their service is actually 25% smaller than that of meals made from store-bought groceries. That kind of blew my mind. So I'm excited that HelloFresh is offering all you fine folks quite the delectable deal. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code EXTRACREDITS12 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. And when you do, you'll be helping to support your wallet, the environment, and our channel all at the same time. Again, that's 12 free meals at HelloFresh.com using the code EXTRACREDITS12. Your time and taste buds will thank you. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.